pictures is when you have read uh, some of his books. The, the Hostage of the Devil, I don't recommend that to anyone unless you have a rosary put by the Pope hanging around your neck. <laughs> You've know, been accustomed to many things and then have, have been in with circum... Uh, and, uh, and, Wicker, but it just kicked them on the old gallopers out. Uh, who needs them? 
and that bishop was a homosexual. A wonderful woman who just uh, tend to go awake at last. And that cardinal who is a, a satanic pedophiliac, literally, why doesn't he simply defrock him and send him into a monastery? And um, then the, the parish priests who uh, don't consecrate at mass, transfers and nuns and priests and convents and monasteries and libraries and magazines and newspapers and parish churches, you know, the whole ball of wax. What's happening in that part of the church? Well, what's happening in that part of the church is a sorry story. Uh, first of all, it's in shambles. Uh, I'm paid, one of the things I'm paid for, paid, haha, um, is to keep statistics. I know there are three kinds of lies, lies, damn lies, and statistics. <laughs> Dr. Johnson said once, but statistics do tell a story. Every statistic is down, everyone. The number of priests, the number of uh, students in seminaries, the number of nuns, the number of undergraduates, Catholic undergraduates, the number of Catholic graduates, the number of Catholic high schoolers, the number of Catholic uh, uh, communicants every day, the number every week, every number of confessions, the number of people going to mass, the number of converts, the number of people dying within the church, the number of marriages, the number of monks, everything's down. It's all going down. Plumb line directly. There's no hope. Whatever. The only place that's an increase is in Africa. We make 16,400 converts per day in Africa, black Africa. In Europe, we lose 7,400 a day. Death and lapse. Um, but Africa is a very particular case. Uh, the only places where there are priests outside of Africa is Poland, Portugal, and Ireland. And I heard one bishop say that, uh, gee, there were too many priests in Poland. Thank God we're not like that any longer. Uh, you can laugh at that and suddenly you find your mouth bitter. It's almost as blasphemy. Um, and he's a very well-known bishop who describes priests who say the Trinity in Mass as, get this, slaughterhouse priests. That's an ugly reference to the blood of Jesus. Slaughter. Keith Simons of Pensacola, Tallahassee. Don't forget his name. He's a blasphemer. Um, and here's a, a dirty history of the past. But many of them have. Um, if I'm rather frank and shooting in the shoulder, it's because the Pope is, of course, most of us, there are any poor amongst you, um, straight from the shoulder, because the time for being a country is past. Because we're in a war. We're losing all the battles. We won the war. The other poor bastards don't know that, but we have. <laughs> uh, but we're losing every battle, steadily, every battle we're losing. Except the only victory we have is when somebody dies and goes to heaven. That's the only victory Jesus ensures. But otherwise, we're on the losing side of the battle's land. But uh, we'll be there on the green side finally when the war is over. Now, so all the statistics are down. And we have the Pope. And the Pope, after all, is Peter. Now, Peter and upon this rock, I built my church, and I give to thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, the keys of this blood. The keys are made strong by my and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. What's he doing with the keys? Are they putting the drawer? What's happening? Um, has he got the power any longer? Does he believe in the power? Is he really Pope? Is he really Peter? Is he really the 263rd successor of Peter? The 264th Pope? Or what's happening? Has he lost his faith? Why isn't he doing something about it? Is he merely a, is he merely a gigolo Pope, as he's been called? Is he a ham actor, as Archbishop Wheaton would call him? Is he a fake, as uh, many others have called him? Who is this Pope and what is he doing? Here? What's happening in the church? I mean, where's the security we used to have, darn it? Well, the answer to that question is very, very difficult to give in one sentence. I'll tackle it from various points of view, and then probably somebody will put me questions and enlighten me on more, okay? Um, some things you'll have to take, you don't take them on faith, don't believe what I say on faith, even on human faith, but some things I cannot explain to you. Uh, <laughs> uh, and some things I can't really explain because, uh, number one, I like my kneecaps too well. <laughs> and I'm not joking. Number one, number two, it'll take too long to explain. Um, the church. Again, the visible structure, remember, 
not the mystical body. Mystical body, Paul says, is without spot or wrinkle, and is presented by Christ to God the Father as his bride. But the church, the structure, here's the difficulty. Since the year 1963, approximately, there is love within the church, what the those who know about it call the super force. It's Satan. I don't mean the old guy with the uh, yellow eyes and uh, large ears and fork tail and hooves with dirty books under his arms and come over and say the teacher to commit sin. No, I'm talking about an archangelic intelligence. The most brilliant intelligence God created. Uh, God never creates anything so brilliant as this angel. Is there a difficulty? Okay. Um, Satan, or Lucifer, whatever you want to call it, who said I will not serve, and who is our mortal enemy, and who is in hell. He doesn't even come out on weekends. Like some of our bishops, but <laughs> some of our bishops, well, he's in hell already, but he comes out on weekends. <laughs> Sometimes it sounds like that. Um, uh, Satan apparently has got permission to be specially let loose for a number of years now. He's coming to the end, it's scorched earth, he's doing as much damage as he can, damage as he can. But he has been installed in the structure of the church, formally, by Catholic Satanists. It's the only sin the Holy Ghost doesn't forgive, by the way, because it's a sin which is done deliberately. It's not through weakness, it's not because I sleep with money, it was why I sleep money because my mother, my mother needs it. It's deliberate sin against God. And he's in possession of bishops and priests, and churches, schools, universities, orders, and they are his uh, minions. We have cardinals who worship him every week, sodomizing little children now, but not just catalyzing anything. There are any young years here. No. Oh, no. thank you, man. Thank you. Um, I didn't notice. Um, and he has got power that we can't break. The Pope can't break it. Pope is too exorcist in the Vatican. He can only really about it. That he can. And he has his network throughout the bishops, the nuns, the orders. And they're very faithful. The Holy Father himself is rather helpless. Let me tell you about the Holy Father. If he wants to go to the bathroom, literally, I'm not joking, there are two men with side arms have to accompany him to the Lord of the bathroom, wait for him. He wears a bulletproof vest, normally. He has two food tasters. He um, can't send a letter. He can't write a letter on the step and send it off to Al or Joe or Patty. No, he can't. He can't receive a letter. It comes to everybody. Um, he can't appoint a bishop. He must get five signatures for every bishop. Um, he literally is bound hand and foot. In June, July 1890, he wrote a letter to all the bishops of the church saying that they had to institute an exposition of the Blessed Sacrament once a week uh, with prayer, with the rosary and suitable prayers for two intentions. First of all, that Satan would lose his grip on the ministers of the church, priests, and number two, that the third secret of Panama would not be implemented. Have you heard about that letter? No. Do you know why? Well, when the Pope writes a letter, again, he's helplessness, it goes to a man called Agostino Casaroli, who was the Secretary of State. And he provides his recommendations on it and sends it to the apostolic delegate or the nuncio in each country. And he writes his recommendations on it. That's choke point two. And he sends it to the bishop's conference. Stroke on another three, and then they decide what to do. In this case, they decide to suppress it. So, I do heard about it now. And um, that's the Pope's helplessness. Uh, he is not free. Number two, uh, it is not un impossible or unlikely that they would take his life if he forced the issue. The difficulty is that he's quite willing to die for the church, except at the present moment there are. 149 cardinals. No, 148. One's just died a week ago. 148 cardinals. Cardinals elect the Pope. Of those 148, only 114 can vote because they're under 
as you know, current to be in country, must be under 80. And uh, of that 114, over two thirds plus one, the majority needed for two elected groups are liberal. So if he's snuffed out, uh, we're facing what we may have to face finally. And he is sparing us that. I think a little generation will look back and recall Pochon Pomo too when he's canonized and say that we did not know what we had by way of the treasure. He's a Pole though, and Poles are very different from us. Uh, they really are. Um, and of course, our Polish joke syndrome has, has increased our ignorance of Poles. Poles are amazing people. They have one great quality, besides other qualities, and it is besides their devotion to Our Lady and that their devotion to Poland and their Catholicity. They have a great sense of the wide world, that geopolitical by nature. And this man is that, he's a geopolitician. He was in Germany in Fulda. Fulda is the place where the bishops meet in Germany. In 1980, and he was surrounded by Catholics, a special group of Catholics, about the size of this one. I was there. <coughs> And uh, they, they were allowed to ask him questions directly face to face, unrehearsed. It was a, not a press conference, it was a question and answer. And they said to him, Holy Father, have you read the secret of that? He said, Yes, I have. I read it twice. And they said, um, Will you tell us what's in it? He said, No, I won't. He's always prosperous a muscle, straight in the shoulder. And they said, um, uh, Is it bad? Are there terrible sufferings? So I can't ask that question, because if I asked that question, it would sound sensational. He said, supposing he said I were to tell you, he saw the expressions on the faces, supposing I were to tell you that Florida was going to float away, and that there were going to be three days darkness, and that one whole nation would be wiped out, completely wiped out, and that the sun would be darkened for another five days, and that most of the earth would be afflicted with an epidemic they couldn't cure, but could live with. And he said, supposing then all the extinct volcanoes uh, were asked up again. What would you call it? It's a sensation. So what's the point of telling you? And then they said, well, Holy Father, are there punishments? He said, there's no punishments. They said, then can we avert those by prayer? He said, no, you can't. It's too late. He said, you can make it. And he took his rosary on his pocket. He said, say that. It's the only protection you have. Say that. It'll be day of your life. The only protection. And they said, within what time limit? I said, I can't ask that. And they said, well, why can't you publish the letter? Because he said, if I publish that letter now, and here's the interesting part, and for this we would never be thanked by the great powers, he said, it would give an edge to the Soviets that the West could not resist. There is information in it which is vital. Now, that's his defense of not publishing the third secret. And John the 23rd was the one who opened it in August of 59 in the Castle of Gandalf on his summer villa, and then opened it again in February 1960. I remember Colonel Bear, who's to my word, asked me to walk over to the Vatican on February 7, 1963. I did, in the early morning. I was his helper, and uh, we walked up to the, took this creaky little elevator. You know, these small elevators in Europe, they fit two people in the dark. And they go up to the fourth floor, creaking all the way, afraid it's going to collapse. <laughs> and we went up to the Pope's apartment on the fourth floor, and then he put me sitting on a, on a bench up there, and then he went in, and then Tisoran came, and Tardini came, and Bea came, I mean, uh, what's his name, Magnani came, all about 17 cardinals, and a few months in your end, two Portuguese translators from the Secretary of State. They remained inside there for about 23 minutes, and then Bea came out perspiring profusely. Bea was, was 84 at that stage, and never perspiring. And uh, we walked down, and we walked across the square to the court of St. Thomas's again to get his car home. And uh, I said to him, what is loss? What's wrong? And he said, uh, today we have decided the fate of billions of human beings. He wouldn't say another thing. Years later, then, before I left Rome, he read the, he read the document about it. It was quite obvious that the decision of Pope John Paul II and John Adolf and John III said, not to reveal the secret, not to publish it, not to conspire Russia, was a fatal decision. Uh, fatal in the sense that 
I may be a fan, but a very simple performance. I'm not sure she's a very simple lady. But like all simple ladies, she's hard to get. You know? she, she's tough. At last I let the children say, how can we trust you? She said, well, I will trust you if you trust me. And there's no nonsense about her lady. And she doesn't speak in long sentences or long messages. It's always pithy and to the point. It's quite clear, by the way. She said, look, I know the Pope of 1960 consecrates Russia to my night heart, in which case it will be converted and the world will be saved miseries, and publishes this message, or our faith will end up the church. We didn't consecrate Russia, the Pope didn't. We didn't publish the letter, therefore we're in the or. We have our faith, and brothers and sisters, have we got our faith? That's where we are. Now the difficult thing for most of us, especially we oldsters, and I can throw rank at most people here, I think, um, uh, they're rank of age, uh, typically with us is this, that you cannot understand a man like Carmen Bundy or a man like Ashish Wheatland or Gumbleton. Uh, and I could go on naming them one after the other after the other, unless you presume he's lost his faith. If you presume that, you can understand. Without faith, it's very, it's the guy doesn't know. Because remember this, if you lose your faith, you don't know you've lost it. If you lose your faith, it's like I, I, I'm a cultural man. You know, I don't put my feet in the man in prison. I don't spit potato for <laughs> But if I suddenly became a barbarian and reverted to that, I didn't know I was like that. Otherwise, I'd change. If you lose your faith, you don't know you've lost it. You think the other guy's stupid. He thinks you're stupid. He's not stupid. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So they, they, they don't know that. They, they, they don't go around saying, well, we've lost our faith, but gee, it's great. <laughs> No, they, they think they're Catholics and that you're not. Well, it's just stupid and funny daddy you are. But they lost their faith. If you keep in the back of your mind that they have lost it, they no longer understand as you understand, then you can at least have a certain tranquility in accepting them as a, a boom fact of life. But if you were to say to yourself, torturedly, how could they do that? How could they have just, just such disrespect for the, for the best sacrament? How could they permit a Richard McBride? How could they speak like that and permit these awful ceremonies? How could they be homosexual? How could they protect homosexuality and pedophilia? How could they protect women, uh, um, bishops and priests who have mistresses? They have no problem. <laughs> they haven't got faith. And another terrible curse of faith is this. And uh, since I was 13, I've been praying that this doesn't happen to me because it happened to everybody. Lose any sense of the supernatural. So you don't know. You don't know. And you can lose it. If I go out and uh, I'm probably Norman Catholic and I'm sleeping with my neighbor's wife, or I'm masturbating, or I'm cheating, or I'm a pedophiliac, just that type of sin, I lose my faith but I don't know it. So that sin. It's not really a sin against purity, it's a sin against justice and faith. And my faith is gone for me and I don't know it. I think I'm okay. I think God will understand that I'm special. You see, yeah. We're all special when it comes to special sins. And you know, it's different with us. Yes, she is not really somebody else's wife, he's somebody else's husband, but well, it's special for us because we're special. We all make an excuse for it. But in the meantime, we've lost our faith. And once that's gone, it's gone. The difficulty is they have lost their faith. They ain't got it any longer. And when the bishops of America forbade, when the priest holds up the host, according to their instructions, he they're forbidden to say, this is the body of Christ forbidden. They can only say the body of Christ. That means because they think the congregation of the body of Christ, this bit of bread is no longer the body of Christ. Them, they don't believe this. If you keep that in the back of your mind, you can explain an awful lot about nuns and about priests and bishops and cardinals, but you won't explain otherwise. And you won't be scandalized in love you'll pray for them because when the angel of Portugal appeared, first of all, prepare the children in 1916 for Fatima 1917, he made them prostrate themselves on the ground and recite this prayer, uh, Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I believe you. I believe in you. I adore you. I hope in you. And I love you. I ask pardon for all those who do not believe in you, do not adore you, do not hope in you, and do not love you. And then have mercy on poor, poor sinners. Because they had seen and they saw in the vision that Our Lady gave them. Cardinals and bishops and priests and nuns and lay people falling into hell like leaves. 
And that's what Christ meant. They know not what to do. The cross. They, they lost faith. They know not know what to do. That was the moment when Satan knew that Jesus was God. And he heard that in his lips. Then he knew he was the Son of God. Because only the Son of God, after all those sufferings, could say that to his son. He said he knew that he was beaten. Um, that's the condition of the church, and that's why it is what it is. There's one last reflection on us this. When they took Jesus prisoner, it was about 10.30 at night, and it was dark. And he was in that possession up at 6 o'clock that evening at sundown, when his head had slumped in his chest and he died with a loud cry. And then they, his body was given to Joseph and Matthias and Our Lady, and he was rest. All that time, Our Lady lost him until Calvary. But when they heard that he was condemned to be crucified, they, everybody knew the way to this hill, Golgotha, which everybody was hung to, the lonely gallows, like we used to have in the Old West. And we, we used to have an island in England, one place where the gallows was, and if you wanted to see an execution, you went there. So they rushed off to see him there. And then they knew he'd be coming up the winding road to that place, which we call the Beato Rosa. And they, they looked for a spot where they'd see Jesus. Just because I see him. And they found a place, she and John and Mary Cleopas and Mary Magdalene, the, 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 the faithful Mary Magdalene, and waited. And then around the corner came this group led by a centurion on a horse and a squad of soldiers, and then the temple priests, and then this figure carrying a crossbeam lashed to his shoulders, because he didn't carry the whole cross, he just carried the crossbeam. The, the, the upright was permanent, up there, like permanent. and they had a song on this, they shoved the crossbeam on top of what he was nailed to. And then when she looked at the figure herself, it wore her seamless robe she had made herself, but she couldn't recognize him in the beginning. He was dying, his face was torn, his nose was broken, he had one black eye at least, to the shroud. He had a crown of thorns and his, the blood had streamed out his face to sleep with it. He was dying. Now I know I've been with, I suppose, literally hundreds of dying people, friends of mine most of them, but not all. And when you look at them first of all when they're dying, you don't recognize them. You've got to look for that, that look between their eyes, and then you realize it's John, it's Mary, it's Joe, it's Patrick, whatever it is. But death has this funny, deep personalization. And when the man dies, or the woman dies, for the first ten or minute, minute, sometimes an hour, there's another the inhuman look, and then the normal look comes back to a pose of death. And you know that, sister. Um, and similarly with Jesus, she could hardly recognize her beloved son. And yet she did recognize him through the dirt and the muck the blood and the disgrace, the shame, the spittle, and his, 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 his whole being was dehumanized. Similarly with us, and we were not even on the Via Dolorosa yet, we were only in the garden. And we still find it difficult to see the church anymore. Because the fathers of the church agreed that the history of the church replicates the history of Jesus in his passion. And by the way, friends, it's true what I just said, we are not even on the Via Dolorosa. And so we're not even that he's not buried yet. The church has not gone underground yet, and therefore the resurrection is pretty far from us. We still have a hell of a lot to go through. That's why I keep on saying to people, it's going to get worse, much worse. That is, so prepare your soul. The Pope was one day having breakfast. He has breakfast with a lot of people every day, as you know. It's a working breakfast. And there was a bishop beside him who was grumbling to him, saying, Holy Father, why don't you do something about this reform of the church? And I can't recognize the church anymore. I'm going to France or Spain. In France, by the way, there are whole hundreds of miles where there's not only there isn't a church open, there isn't a church. There's no convent, there's no rectory, there's no priest, there's no nun, there's nobody baptizing. There isn't a baptized person. It's pagan. It's pagan. Austria, the same thing, Germany, the same thing, West Germany, and East Germany. Now, so he was going with Holy Father about this and saying, Why don't you do something about it, Holy Father? John Paul got very angry with my pregnancy. But I was that you come with me. And he walked out and he said, you, and he said uh, Your Grace, he said, Look here, you've just got to be like the, the widow of Nazareth. He said, The widow of Nazareth. He said, The widow of Nazareth. Jesus disappeared in the year 33. She lived, what, 30 years, 40 years? She lived in a pagan land, Ephesus, with John. She had to, the Jews wanted to kill all the Christians, including her, especially the mother of this Jesus, the revolutionary that had put into the fall of Judaism. She, she had to live, lived on faith. There were no angels around her. Our house in Ephesus, which we have today, looked across the sea, by the way, in the direction of Rome. And I suppose the apostles passed up and down. It was the land trip to 
not to get across to Italy. We had to cross to Ephesus. I'm sure Peter went through Paul and Thomas. I'm sure they all went through it. I'm sure they all went through it. But all she had was faith. She was the widow of Nazareth, living there. And she lived with that faith for 30 years. Until one night she fell asleep and woke up in heaven. She didn't die. She couldn't die. And, and then found herself crowned as queen of heaven, queen of the cosmos, the mother of God. Um, but her faith, said with us, it's pure faith. And it's very nice to be consoled in devotion, to feel good, and to be surrounded by people like you who love Jesus and, uh, and the angels and pray to them are united about the Pope. But we ain't got that any longer. We should network more amongst ourselves. There are many more of us than we know. But still, we're alone. And uh, as the Pope said, we've got to imitate her in our faith, blind faith. And remember, faith is a funny thing. Most people faith, for most people, faith seems to be a feeling. It isn't a feeling. Feeling has nothing to do with faith. For most people, too, faith is a matter of the will. It's not a matter of the will primarily. Faith is a knowledge. Through a glass darkly, that is, if you're baptized and in the state of grace, you already have knowledge of the mysteries of God and of faith, but you don't know you know it. They're there for you as springs of action, and they will inspire you to do good. Your will locks that in. That you must nourish your will to hold your mind on the knowledge of life and faith, which only comes out in your actions. You have the series of concepts of it. Your concepts of the mystery of the Gospels, but not of the mysteries themselves. And you must nourish that by faith, and it's bleak. And this is the time for faith. Now, Our Lady said at uh, Fatima that it's going to be a period of unfaith, and that's what it is, except in Portugal. Except in Portugal. And even the elect, she said, None of them would, would, would survive unless those days were shortened. So if you're tempted against faith by discouragement, or by seeing people around who don't believe, or who, are, who have another type of faith, another type of Catholicity, Neo-Catholicism as we call it, don't be tempted to stick with your faith. It's hard. But remember the widow of Nazareth. And I think I'm beginning to wander slightly, and I think I should leave the floor open to questions. And the uh, boys, I can hear but the certain churches, and you know, government, we wouldn't give you a But we should have been able to resist. If we all did, we'd have wiped out the thing. We didn't. We went along because we were supposed to obey. What it's very difficult, huh? What about the documents that are coming out of Rome, though, that are contrary to what... Well, then, then you don't obey them. But it's the magisterium, but that's okay. No, it's not the magisterium, but uh, if, 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 it's not, if it's not the Pope or Ratzinger, and is, is, then it's not the magisterium. Not necessarily. You must know that they sanction it. Do they sanction it? That's the difficulty today. Dispute over the Catholic Priest. Feel that that Catholic could be done. All of this would turn around. Yeah. 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 Yeah
disobedient about our yes. tradition, but that he stayed with tradition. Yes. The Queen of England never changed tradition. Yes. And in the church today, you go to different churches, yes. and it's a different mass in every church. That's right. A different and ceremony. I can say, as you say, McBride was next communicated, but yet Archbishop Lefebvre was. Yes. Well, the, the excommunication is a joke. You know, he's not excommunicated. You can't be to get an issue of mortals and he has the mission of mortals. Um, he's a blessing to the church. He did cleverly stick a fishbone in the gullet of Roman bureaucracy. They can't swallow it and they can't cough it up. <laughs> they can't get rid of it. He's growing. And they can't absorb it. He refuses to be absorbed. You're talking, what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> We're just talking about it. Don't you have the power right into the camera? Yeah. We just said that. Is that communication in the system? No. No. It's a joke. There was a man called Father Feeney, Leonard Feeney, in the 50s, who was excommunicated, and uh, four years ago his followers got another thing to it became turned and run at the same time. He was excommunicated by Bishop Wise, who was a homosexual, by uh, Cardinal Spellman, and by Cardinal Cushing, who were both in league with the Masons at that time, and he was converting the sons of Masons in Harvard. So he decided to get rid of him, and the Jesuits collaborated and got rid of him. And he died in yeah. persecution, but he's in heaven. And uh, they're also dead, and I just wonder where they are. Because we're all humorous. We're not. We're not. great fun. <laughs> Don't be too much gloomy. It's a realism. Well, would you tell them about um, the Pope's vision of our lady and the hopes that we have? Well, he, he, Mehmet Ali Aksha, you know, shot him in St. Peter's Square, mm. tried to kill him, but didn't succeed because the Pope went down, as you know, there was a little girl in front of him with a blouse with a picture of our lady Fatima. She was a daughter of a carpenter from Avellino, southeast of Rome, and the bullet squeezed over his head and they hit his skull, and they hit two American troops who now have them in glass cases on their mattresses. Um, and two other bullets hit him in the torso, and yet he was locked up to hospital. He was brought to the wrong hospital, by the way. Every week there's a practice run with the Pope's mobile, the Pope mobile, and his own blood is kept in the Isola Tiborina. Tiborina. That's an hour in the middle of the Tiber where there's a hospital for the Pope alone with his blood. He wasn't kept. He heard. So then he sent for a nun, who was the coordinator of the Mary movement, who was an expert at Fatima, and brought her over to the hospital. And uh, you do have difficulties there. <laughs> Put it in order, first of all, I'll stop and wait. <laughs> Take your time to Palatini? No. He never announced his doctrine. He never announced the doctrine of the church. I know he did.